believe me, you would be bored to tears if you had to sit through a lecture of all of the work that I have ever done. Uh, so I've really been selective and um, I hope that the series that I have selected uh, will give you a broad enough sense of the types of things that I have been interested in um, regarding color and the strategies that I have used to uh, answer questions that I have brought up to myself about uh, the multidimensionality of color. Uh, the first few shots here are of my studio. So this is 330G. Uh, I am in the hood in Saskatoon. So I'm in the west side with this building. Um, it's a lower class neighborhood and one that has been notorious for a lot of criminal activity, drug activity, etc. However, um, this building seems to sit very quietly in its space and we have really fit into the neighborhood and haven't had any problems um, since I moved in here. My husband and I bought this building in 2010. It was originally built as the first Ukrainian labor temple in Saskatoon, the first communist labor temple. And so workers from the Ukraine would come to Canada, to Saskatoon, um, they would meet in this building and they would learn how to speak English here and also uh, do cultural activities. So when we bought it, it was actually a house. It was zoned residential and we had it rezoned back into what it was originally intended to be, which was a cultural center. And so what I do in this space is I have my own studio in here and I also rent out studio space to other artists. The backyard has a garden area and I spend a lot of time back here in the summer because I grow, I seem to be able to grow tomatoes. I mean, go figure. I had no idea I could even grow anything, but I seem really to be able to grow tomatoes and there are a lot of very poor people in the area. And so I grow tomatoes and give bags of tomatoes to my neighbors because many of them can't afford to buy them in the store. So that's kind of a fun side project. If I'm waiting for paint to dry in the inside of the building, I go to the backyard and just pick weeds or whatever. Um, this is another view. I had a gardener from the farmer's market come and help me set the backyard, the grounds up. So all of the plants that are in the backyard come from the farm, from a prairie farm, a Saskatchewan prairie farm. And the rhubarb was her grandmother's the tall plants behind the rhubarb are hops uh, that really seem to grow incredibly well um, in my backyard and they extend uh, around to the back fence. So I kind of have a green fence around the back of the property um, and it really is quite beautiful and a beautiful respite in the summer to just be able to go and sit in the backyard. This is the inside of the studio and this is my space in the studio. So as I said, I have, at the moment I have eight other artists who work in the building with me. Um, I have this large space on the main floor that moves into what used to be the stage, which is where the Ukrainian um, laborers would put on their performances um, uh, on this, you know, proscenium. There's studio spaces above the proscenium arch. There are studio spaces in the basement and there are other small areas on the main floor and off the main floor um, where artists are renting spaces from me. At one point, this was the Saskatoon Chinese Mennonite Church. And so there were crying rooms for babies, <laughs> which is now one studio space. There was an office for the priest uh, which has been converted into another studio space. So the building is really um, full and utilized to the maximum um, in the way that it was originally meant to be used. And I'm really happy about that. Uh, the project space that I run is in the front foyer. And if you want to access exhibitions in that project space, all you have to do is go to www. 330smallg.ca. There's a painting show up in the project space right now um, of 
Western Canadian, 10 Western Canadian painters, established and emerging painters. Coming out of COVID, I wanted to have a conversation between generations and between Western Canadian artists, painters, who I wanted to treat as a community rather than individuals, um, a community speaking to other members of the community. Um, and I hope that you will check that out on the website. I also have an Instagram account at Marie Lanou 5 lowercase, all one word. Um, and I am regularly posting images of uh, the current show. The last show that was up at 330G was called Journal of the Plague Year. And the Globe and Mail, Marsha Lederman did a huge spread last weekend in the Globe and Mail. Um, I think there were three articles in the print and the online editions that featured work from this particular exhibition. So I was really happy about that for the artists. It's a space that I fund entirely myself. Okay, I know I'm crazy. Um, but when I do that, that means that I can showcase work of people who I am very interested in. And I can also do that when I feel like doing it and when I have the time. So it gives me enormous freedom and I'm not answering to anyone else. My, my um, MO is to promote artists work from stu one studio to another studio. There's no middle people. I don't sell the work. If anyone's interested in buying it, they can simply contact the artists directly. I just wanna get the work out into the world. I want the work from Saskatoon and Saskatchewan artists seen in context with other artists from away. And this is my small way of giving back to the community. Okay, so this is my studio space here. And as you can see, I, I tend to do a lot of work. I'm a full-time practitioner. I don't have any other jobs. This is what I do. And I tend to work a lot and fill up um, any space that I happen to have. So my next, there's another one. So a lot of the paintings that you see here on the tables, there will be close-ups of them at the end of the presentation because these many of these works are works that I have produced over the last COVID year. Um, I was telling Robin and Doreen earlier, I, I've never been more productive. I mean, I had no way of predicting that COVID would mean I would be as incredibly productive as I have been. Um, and so, you know, this is just a small selection of, I don't know, there are a lot of paintings that I've done uh, in the past year. Uh, I tend to work flat on tables. Um, and uh, I also work on a powdered stone substrate. So at the back of this shot, you can see uh, these hanging racks with uh, works on, it's not really paper, it's powdered stone and resin that binds this into a flat substrate. Um, calcium carbonate actually, which is found all over the prairies. I really love this material to work on. And because I use very high gloss medium in a lot of cases, you can't lay one on top of the other, they'll stick to each other. So I have to hang them on hangers on coat racks, essentially. But it would be fun to actually have an exhibition, I think, like this with these works hanging on coat racks because um, there is something lovely about this idea of being able to move them around, touch them, um, have some sort of a hands-on um, relationship with these pieces that I really quite like. So there's another close-up shot of the many this is just one iteration of the tables. They all get taken off and another set gets filled uh, or, you know, fills the tables up um, and so on and so on. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with, so, you know, these are the paintings on canvas. The next shot um, will show you another aspect of the research that I have been doing into color. I'll start with a quote from David Batchelor, who is a Scottish artist living in London, who has worked with and written extensively about color. One of the books that he wrote is called Chromophobia, which I'm sure a lot of you have read. And in his book, The Luminous and the Gray, he says, I quote, 
Color belongs to both the arts and the sciences, to both high and popular culture, both to theory and to storytelling. Color is truly fluid. It spills over subjects and seeps between disciplines. It escapes those containers that were built to house it and drips into the places that were designed to keep it out. He goes on to say that as a result, insights about color come from a wide range of different places. So as you saw in this slide, I've been working with color for many years using layers and layers of transparent acrylic color to build both a physical and an illusionistic depth of field. This is an old master's glazing technique, but instead of oil paints, I'm using acrylics. Several of these series have dealt with the painted color as light. I was applying many layers, building an architecture to create an internal luminosity within the painting to achieve color that felt like it was illuminated from within using a very low tech approach by hand painting each of the layers. Robert Enright in a review for Border Crossings called me a color field painter and that's F-E-E-L-E-D. And many people have mentioned Rothko when they speak about my color. In these works, I was after a very visceral emotional response. Surfaces were extremely high gloss to reflect and add the viewer as an embodied subject and participant. It only occurred to me somewhat recently that I didn't really know much about the physics of light in relation to the perception of color in humans. At the same time, I experienced a bit of synchronicity. I had been reading about deeper layers of space where light was being used to look into matter at the subatomic particle level, like the work being carried out at the synchrotron here in Saskatoon. It's the Canadian light source synchrotron at the University of Saskatchewan. And at the same time, I had also heard an episode of Quirks and Quarks with Bob McDonald on CBC Radio. During an archeological dig, a German scientist unearthed a moth that was brilliant lime green. Winged insects are generally found with no color in their wings when they are unearthed, just brown or gray and squished flat. But why had this moth retained its color? And this wasn't that long ago that this was discovered. She took it back to the lab and put it under a powerful microscope and found that the structural integrity of the moth's wings had been maintained in the material it was encased in. This led her to deduce that it was the structure at tiny scale inside the wings that interacted with light to produce the lime green color. So I asked myself, why wasn't I looking at color in a deeper way at its source? To understand how color comes into being, I had to study the physics of light. Color doesn't exist in the dark. When you turn off the lights tonight before going to sleep, Remember the color of your bedclothes because when the lights are out, they are black. Color needs light to exist. This exhibition at the Mental Art Gallery in Saskatoon in 2010 was called Through and Through and Through. I collaborated with scientists at the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron because I was interested in this idea of three-dimensional color. <clears throat> The synchrotron is perfectly situated in Saskatoon as well because we have one of the highest numbers of days filled with sunlight in the year in Canada. What better place to have a light source that looks into the subatomic particle, uh, into levels of subatomic particle matter uh, than here in Saskatoon. I discovered a material called diffraction grading material and I had no idea what it was. So rather than go to the physics department and start researching by reading, I decided I would approach the scientists at the synchrotron. I made an appointment with three of them. They brought me in, I brought the material with me and I asked them how it worked. So diffraction grading material has these tiny slits in its surface. This is reflective diffraction grading material. The tiny slits in the surface of this material receive light and break the spectrum up into its constituent color components. So I thought, why not create an installation where my viewer would be fully immersed in three-dimensional color, not only on the walls of the installation, 
made using this reflective diffraction grading material, but also on the floor, which uh, I lined with just a white polymer and the three-dimensional color reflections then hit the surface of the floor. This is what it looks like with me standing in it. The wall was almost six feet high. It was 64 feet long. Um, and when you walked inside of the installation, you were fully immersed in three-dimensional color and color reflection. Um, I felt that it had to be of an architectural scale. I didn't think that the effect of three dimensional, this immersive three-dimensional color reflection um, would work if it was, you know, 10 feet, let's say. It, it simply had to be this giant monolithic kind of a, a walk-in immersive experience to fully get, I thought, what I was after. One of my friends at the time that the installation was up uh, was partially, well, almost totally blind. And I was very interested to wheel, she was also, she's also um, a paraplegic. And so I wanted to put Carla inside this space in her wheelchair and I chose one of the rounded sections of the space because I was interested to, to find out whether or not she could see the color. And so I wheeled Carla into one of the curves of the space and um, set her there and just started asking her questions. Can you see anything? Can you see anything, Carla? Do you, you know, whatever. And she said, I can't see anything, Marie, but I am so hot. I can feel this. You have to take my coat off which I thought was a really interesting reaction for someone who had very little sight. She couldn't see, but she could actually feel the light and the heat that was emanating off of this material uh, within the gallery space. Um, this is just another shot. Again, walking around the space, the installation was immersive and interactive. So every time you moved within the space, the spectrum would change. Um, so it was just a very animated, experiential um, installation. And I quite like that about it. Color is unstable and it is always in the process of coming into being. And while people walk through this, that's exactly what happened. This is what the material looks like when it is transparent. The other material, as I said, was reflective. So what that means is that it was lined with almost tin foil, if you can imagine. Um, this transparent material was put onto an aluminum foil uh, situation, and that's why it reacted in this way. Without that aluminum foil backing, this is what diffraction grading material looks like. And as I said, I up until this point had been painting with many, many layers of acrylic paint. And I set the material up with the transparent diffraction grading uh, material in the same way, layers and layers, small pieces on top of the other, so that as you move around these uh, works on paper, the color would change based on light interacting with the tiny slits in the material. This is a slide of uh, the diffraction, the transparent diffraction grading material on a white background and on a black background, just to show you uh, the difference uh, that a reflected back light background and one that absorbs light uh, had on the particular material. These were small pieces. I thought of them actually almost as petals on a flower. I'm very fascinated with nature and how natural objects um, deal with color or you know, enable humans to see color and the strategies that nature actually has devised in the petals of a flower, for example, a tulip, let's say, um, to increase and decrease the intensity uh, of the color and also to um, vary the color, the color within one small flower head. Uh, and I use the simplicity of that 
um, very often as a thinking point uh, in the paintings that I'm doing. So, so the first series then is uh, a sort of an investigation into the physics of light, uh, the use of this diffraction grading material to produce color with completely non-conventional artists' materials. I mean, I wasn't using paint, I wasn't using brushes, I wasn't using pastels, or I wasn't even using any conventional materials, but here I was getting full three-dimensional spectrum color from a material that was interacting with light, which, you know, as a painter was completely fascinating to me. This, then I decided to try using the sun as my light source. And so I got permission to put up a mural on the outside of an artist run center in Saskatoon called AKA. Obviously the sun is the most powerful source of light and I wanted to set this material up yeah. in a way that would generate color reflection outdoors. Um, as you know, we are land of the living sky and the prairies. We get a ton of sun. Um, and in this uh, image, you can see some of the reflections that happened when I curved uh, this uh, reflective diffraction grading material on this surface. And here you see more reflections, but also you see a prairie sky um, interacting with a full color reflection, uh, curvilinear installation on the outside of a building. This was the first outdoor project that I ever did. And um, during the day, I would have, you know, three dimensional color reflections from the sun. Um, here's another one with our beautiful clouds. Um, it's, it looks a bit washed out. Actually, it was more intense than this, but when you shoot it in the full sun, it's hard to capture uh, the full color, but you get a sense of what it looks like. Also, the open door is there just to give you a sense of scale. The mural was 51 feet wide and 15 feet high. And so during the day, I would get full uh, reflected color. And at night, I would get a drawing. There would be, again, as I said, color exists with light. And um, there were no reflections on the surface of this material. And so during the day, I would have a painting, or at least this is how I considered looking at it. I would have a painting during the day with color. And at night, I would have a contour drawing. Back into the studio. The next series that I attempted was a series of paintings, again, acrylic on panel of the individual colors of the spectrum, six, not seven or more. I just decided red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, make it simple. And what I wanted to add to my understanding of color was time. And how I decided that I would be able to do that was by creating layers of color one over the other. They started as a diamond shape at the top of these panels. Here is a better one. So here was the red. So it started at the top with um, the most minimal amount of red pigment that I could add that actually registered a light, light, light rose. And then each diamond on top of the next and so on had an equal amount of more pigment, three drops. I can't remember. I have notes on all of this, but anyway, three drops more and then three drops more and so on and so on until you got to the bottom of the painting. And as I said earlier, color is unstable and it is always in the process of coming into being because of light and the changeability of light over the course of the day in our lives. And so I had to come up with a configuration that would get to the heart of this idea of time and also this notion of the constant changeability of the color 
uh, as you moved through the space around this painting. And so as I said, I chose a diamond shape. I chose to repeat that diamond shape over itself over and over and over again so that by the time you got to the bottom of the painting, it split up into these tiny pixelated squares. And pixelation is obviously the way that color is produced on a screen as well. And so I was taking that into account um, uh, on top of everything else. Um, Light-based, time-based uh, in terms of starting uh, with very little pigment and then working my way into a very robust red um, surface. Each of the squares would receive light on the outside in a different way than it would receive light in the center. And so it was like a faceted um, stone, essentially. Um, you know, a, a piece of jewelry, which I love, um, you know, colored stones. And the reason they um, cut facets into stones, including diamonds, is so that they can accept light and change when that light is accepted. And so I was using very similar principles, nothing complicated, uh, just very, very time consuming work. I don't know how many layers there were on these things, but there were a lot. Um, but again, it was simply trying to illustrate the multifaceted nature of the changeability of the colors within the spectrum. And so I did each of them um, on their own and hung them as a series of six. And it was actually purchased as a series of six. And then what I did was uh, I decided to do a similar thing on aluminum. So these are five by five foot sheets of aluminum. Um, and I went through the six colors of the spectrum again, although I think I might have added seven here with indigo. Um, and I wanted once again to use this layering technique to add the component of time, a fourth dimension is how I really uh, thought of it into these paintings. Every single layer, I think by the time I was finished, I think there were 96 layers of paint on each one of these uh, pieces. And every uh, section of the painting had to be connected. So if you think of a rainbow, for example, there isn't a beginning or an end. It is a continuity. It is a continuum. You move through the spectrum from one side to the other and back again. And I was interested in this notion of continuity in terms of color. And although I do have a linear structural component uh, to these particular pieces, the central uh, square is made up of the 96 layers of paint that have gone into the rest of uh, each of these paintings. And that was sort of the residual aftermath I guess, um, of the 96 layers. And uh, I really liked the fact that they moved from a light treatment at the outer periphery into a very robust and, um, yeah, just a very robust sense of color by the time you got into the center. Uh, and once again, when you moved, when you moved around these paintings, they changed, the colors just changed as you moved around them. And, you know, there were five to 20 feet of painting. Um, it was quite uh, an immersive experience as well. And as you can see in this particular shot, um, they reflected into the floor which, you know, again, color, I, I had it spreading out into, into its environment. It wasn't existing on its own anymore. It was actually bleeding out into the world um, that it existed in. And I really quite liked uh, that idea. And this was also expanding my notion of uh, color in a similar way to um, the first uh, piece that I showed you, which was through and through and through, where my viewer was going to be fully immersed in the colors of the spectrum. So here is a close up of one of the single pieces. And I went from red to 
orange, red, violet. So I picked sections of the spectrum and then moved via gradation through sections of the spectrum. So this one was blue, green, violet or green, blue, violet, sorry, and so on. So that each of these four paintings in the series connected to the next one in the same way that a rainbow is a continuity and connects one side to the other. Then, um, this is another um, exhibition that I had in 2019. So we're jumping up a few years, but um, I got further immersed in this notion of the physics of light. And this particular exhibition was called The Architecture of Color. And I was very interested, or my, my interest continued in the actual structural components of light that enable humans to see color. I connected with an artist in the United States who was um, doing 3D printing and commissioned him to 3D print the wavelengths of four of the colors of the spectrum. And in the installation, this is one of, this isn't exactly what it looked like. This is one of the working shots of this installation. But the, this was the first room of the exhibition called The Architecture of Color. And what I wanted was to flood the room with re reflections of these wavelengths. What I was interested in showing my viewer was that this invisible space between you and the next person or you inside of a room was actually full of the raw material, the raw data that we use to see color. And I wanted the beginning of this show to be black and white. I wanted these reflections to be well, gray, I guess is what they look like. I didn't want there to be any color because I wanted a viewer to see that in fact, wavelengths are what the human eye, the human optic brain processes in order to enable us to see color. And these wavelengths flood every single space that we inhabit on a daily basis. And these wavelengths also enable us to navigate through space. So the little device on the left-hand side is nine inches in diameter. I had doubled it in the exhibition and I think it's five inches high. So this tiny little thing with a chandelier light bulb in it, and I think it was only a 40 watt bulb, ended up flooding this room with floor to ceiling wavelength reflections. And again, the point of doing this was to showcase this notion that what we consider empty invisible space is actually full of the material that we use and process to make our way through the world. Then from that room, which is behind where the red uh, disc is situated in this particular, particular shot, you moved into uh, three primary colors of the spectrum and the wavelengths of the entire spectrum etched into acrylic panels that were three eighths of an inch thick and projected off the wall, I believe by, I think it was six inches. So they were on acrylic, uh, round acrylic bases that projected out from the wall so that we could light them from behind. So these three discs, here's a close up of one of them have all of the colors of the wavelengths of the spectrum etched into their surface a quarter of an inch. I ended up coloring the wavelengths from the back using adhesive trans transparent gels. And the front of this particular blue um, disc is painted. And what I was trying to get at with this one was using Eve's Klein blue, international blue. So I communicated with the studio in Paris uh, that has the copyright and is the only place that I could find to sell Eve Klein blue and I wasn't able to get any. So I found a substitute, a theatrical 
paint substitute that is actually quite close to Eve Klein Blue. Um, but anyway, I was taking his international blue into account in this particular um, primary color and trying to speak to the history of that particular color, but in my um, contemporary way, I guess. Now, when wavelengths are all at the same intensity, um, you get white light. And so that's what happens in the center of each of these panels. Oops. So the center you see is white and the outside of that center is colored. So again, it's the colors of the spectrum when they're at the same intensity, the center reveals white light. So as I said, you moved from that 3D printed room into this room that added painterly color because the colors on these discs, on the faces of these discs were acrylic color. The background color was uh, transparent gels. And then you moved into another room, which was blue over Saskatoon, summer, winter, and fall. And what I was interested in doing here was referring to a Swiss physicist um, whose name was Herastus Osur, and he was a, a mountain climber. And he was a geologist, a physicist. I mean, he did a number of different things, but what he, what he thought was that as you climbed higher in the mountains, the color of the blue sky grew more intense. He was proven wrong, but anyway, I just found the research and even just the idea of this is really fascinating. And so I decided um, because I live on the prairies and we have more blue sky than most places in, on the planet and we have more blue sky that you can actually see that isn't full of pollution. I decided that I was going to do a very intensive look, um, a study of the changes over the course of a day in each of the seasons of the blue sky. And so at the very top of each of these um, installations, on the left-hand side is summer, on the floor is fall, and on the right-hand side is winter. I started at seven o'clock in the morning, and by the time you got to the bottom disc, uh, it's about 10 o'clock at night. So this is my general day. And I wanted to situate it very specifically to me. And so I observed and photographed the sky behind my house and behind my studio. The sky above my studio and above my house, period. I didn't go anywhere else. I really wanted to situate myself geographically and have a close look at the change in the color blue in my very specific private world. Well, I had no idea that the blue sky experienced so many changes over the course of the day. And close observation revealed a number of things. So if you look at the bottom blue on the left-hand set of summer, that very bottom blue, there were 25 panels in each one of these sets. Each of those panels is 13.5 inches in diameter and 3 eighths of an inch thick. So the bottom panel of the left-hand summer sky and then you refer to the right hand winter panel and go down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the far left outer panel of the one, two, three, the fifth row, that bottom summer and that center left hand panel are the same color of blue. That bottom panel on the left hand side is 10 p.m. because here in Saskatchewan on the prairies, at 10 p.m. on a summer evening, it is still quite bright out and significantly blue. And the panel on the right-hand side, which is winter, that would be about 3.30 in the afternoon. So the 10 p.m. summer blue corresponded to the 3.30 p.m. winter blue. By the time you hit 10 p.m. in the winter on the right-hand side, it is blue-black. 
And that was another thing that I had never really taken into consideration and observed. The blue sky at its darkest is never black. It's still full of blue. It's just dark, 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 pitch black blue, um, but it's still blue. And, you know, the bottom panel or the, the floor panel, I situated the autumn blue on the floor and not on the wall ahead of us because I wanted my viewer to look down to see what was up. I just wanted to skew their normal way of viewing the blue sky in the autumn and have them look down. I called it a narcissus effect to see what would have been reflected above. So this is summer and this is fall, um, sort of looking at each other. It's hard to tell in these images, but each of these panels was hand painted. I didn't want them to look like I had just gone to Benjamin Moore and you know bought cans of paint that you know whatever and then just slapped them on. No, I wanted there to be breath and life within the application of the paint in each one of these discs. And so much like viewing the sky, you know, there's never, it's never um, uniformly the same. There are inflections, there are clouds that might um, hint themselves into a frame, you know, and as a painter, I wanted these, these um, discs to be painterly. I wanted them to be full of the handmade, the inflections of my hand that gave life to each one of these panels in the same way that the blue sky is full of life. I also did a series of blue sky paintings on aluminum panels again, similar to the um, series that I worked on um, called Kin, which was the one that I showed you earlier uh, of the spectrum colors. So again, these started at the top uh, right hand side and moved from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. Um, the far left is summer, the center is fall, and the right hand side is winter. Here is winter. And I simply split up my aluminum panel into 27 sections. I think that's how many there are here. And observed the change in that sky and incrementally added pigment um, to reflect the changes in uh, not only the color of blue, but also the intensity uh, of the blue. And this particular painting will be reproduced on the cover of a book that is coming out in 2021 um, on nanostructures, which is really kind of fun uh, because that's definitely an area that I will get to uh, shortly. But one of my interests in um, structural color and how it comes into being. This looks empty, but what's actually in this is this. So the architecture of color, this was another piece in the architecture of color. Um, my family and I went to Iceland and one of the trips that we took was to the Blue Lagoon. I had never seen or experienced an otherworldly blue like the blue we experienced at the Blue Lagoon. And when I came back to Saskatoon, I was determined that I was going to find materials that would enable me to recreate the experience of the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. Now, the Blue Lagoon is a crater and it's filled with geothermal water and silica sand. Light interacts with the silica particles and reflects back blue to the human optic brain. I searched and searched and searched for a phosphorescent alternative um, to this um, silica sand blue in Iceland. And I finally found one in New York City. And um, here's another small piece so, so this piece that you're looking at is actually this piece here. You can kind of see the shape uh, of the blue shape, two slides forward uh, in the background. And 
what happened here was I had lights that were illuminating uh, the phosphorescent material that is painted on this canvas to excite the particles so that when you turn the lights out, this is what showed up. Um, so here was a way of producing blue, but a blue that only showed up in the dark, right? I mean, blue shows up for us in the light. Here I had found a material to do the absolute opposite, to show the color, its essential color in the dark. And again, in terms of this notion of multidimensionality, um, this was an experience of color that I had and that I wanted my viewers to have and that I tried to recreate using acrylic paint and phosphorescent powder. So what I did was I simply, this powder is like so expensive, you can't believe it. For like a cup of it, it's like a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So I had to be very careful with it when I was using it and um, I only did small scale work because it was just too expensive to waste. Um, oh, I don't have any more there. But anyway, uh, what I was getting at was building structures on canvas that were similar to the idea of the wavelength that enabled us to see color via the optic brain um, that looked like three-dimensional spatial structures once this material was activated and once light, uh, in fact, excited the particles within, within these phosphorescent materials uh, and enabled them to illuminate uh, the color that they actually were. Blue happens to be, for whatever reason, one of the more difficult colors to uh, produce. There's a lot of phosphorescent green, and I think there's also orange. Um, Phosphorescence is also different than fluorescence. This has a longer uh, shelf life, meaning if you illuminate the particles in a phosphorescent painting, they take a longer time to lose their charge. So this would have stayed illuminated um, over a few hours. And the way it was set up in my exhibition was there were light stands in front of these paintings that had little foot pedals so that my viewer could actually turn the lights on and off and interact with the work in a way that uh, was definitely more intense than any other uh, painting exhibition I had ever had. And I really wanted to foster this notion of interactivity with the viewer, having them control the light levels and what in fact it was that they saw. Um, and that was another dimensional aspect that I added um, to this exhibition. So this one was actually like, you know, capturing a little house shape um, in that central uh, black rectangle. I mean, it, these are as flat as a board, you know, they're just so flat, but honestly, when you see them in the flesh, it's just like, oh my God, you want to stick your hand right inside that black shape and pull something out or feel what's behind that. And I really love that idea as well, that it would stimulate the senses in such a way that you actually wanted to put your hand inside there and pull out what might be inside that black space. Okay, so here we are in COVID. Uh, and once again, this is how I work. You see knowledge-based or scientific research-based work, and then you see very visceral, intuitive, uh, emotionally based uh, paintings. And I have a personality that is of those two extremes. And so David Batchelor's idea of color belonging to both the arts and the sciences fits very, very well and is very suited to my personality. So this is one of the paintings. Um, I have maybe seven or eight paintings that I've produced over the course of this COVID year. And what you'll notice in this one, I called this painting sinusoidal red. You can see sort of at the bottom where the dark gradation starts to open up and get lighter that there's actually a wave. Now it's not the actual wavelength of red, 
but I very much had this notion of trying to uh, physically paint a wavelength without actually painting a wavelength. And so uh, it's just via manipulation of paint, pulling with squeegees, um, and depositing more paint, lifting more off, a lot of underpainting, obviously, that you can see uh, on the edges, um, and also through the body of the painting as well. Um, but I was really still interested in this notion of wavelength uh, in terms of pigmented color. I got very robust. Uh, this would have been painting that was done in the, towards the end of last summer, but still the COVID pandemic summer. Um, and it must have been an antidote just to the feeling of isolation and lockdown. Um, and I just got terribly interested in this beautiful pink. I don't own anything pink. I, you know, pink is not one of my go-to colors, but it really spoke to me. And um, so I did a series of paintings that are very, very deeply, deeply, uh, deeply pink. Um, and again, there is no beginning and end in some sections of the color. I wanted it to feel like a continuity that it sort of came into being uh, and then left, much like the wind travels through the prairies. You know, there's no beginning to the wind and there's no end to the wind. It just travels through and then leaves and then comes back again. It's not like a stop start activity. Um, and here it was the same sort of thing. I wanted also in using this notion of continuity to open up the possibility of pockets of light. And so, you know, at the top right hand corner and the bottom section, for example, there's breathing space there. There's light that's allowed to come behind the pink and illuminate it from behind. Here's another pink one. And you can, it's, it's a, a much more of a close up of my process as well. So as I said, I use these um, squeegees um, and I like using durometers that are very uh, flexible. So I don't use hard squeegees and these are made for me. They're big wooden squeegees and um, the rubber is quite flexible and that enables me to uh, move the paint around in a simpatico way to my sensibilities um, and deposit it where I want it deposited and uh, pull it away um, where I want it pulled away. So these paintings, all of the paintings in this past COVID year have been totally based on intuition. So I just put the knowledge um, yearning to the side and it was guts, intuition, all or nothing. You know, if you're gonna use pink, go for it. Do not hold back, no holds barred. Um, that was the mindset that I was in. It was sort of like, if I'm gonna be isolated, I'll show you isolation. And so I just really went for it. And I hadn't painted on canvas in 30 years. So all of these paintings that you're seeing and the ones that were produced in this past year um, were just, I was desperate to work smaller. I was desperate to work on a new material. I didn't want to use panels. I didn't want to use aluminum. I didn't want to be big. That, that Architecture of Color exhibition was so big. I just wanted something intimate and emotional and handheld that I could just experience in a quiet contemplative way. And so, um, Canvas was the way to go. And these are all stretched canvases, primed and stretched. I didn't want to have to do any extra work. I just wanted to go, you know, like the painting is ready, the canvas is right there, start. I said everything was intuitive, but in the back of my mind, I was also in some of these dark ones thinking about black holes. And there was a discovery, you're going to have to help me out with this, but 
what was discovered about black holes, something relevant over the last year. Anyway, I was part of the news cycle and I listened to it and I just thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And also I was just thinking of black holes in terms of just the total absorption of color and light, right? And um, there is there are a number of paintings um, in these series that, uh, although they don't specifically refer to black holes, I was definitely thinking about um, what black holes look like and what they actually do in relation to light and actually in relation to color. Here's another one. Marie, um, the black hole, it was the first ever image of a black hole. That's what you were working on, but also, <laughs> yeah. also I'm giving you your five minute. Um, okay, okay, um, I'm almost done. When was that Robin? Do you remember what month we were in? Like it was this last year, right? Uh, yeah, it was September. Our time is so weird in this last yeah. year. Well, anyway, it was like, oh my God, our first image of a black hole. How do, <laughs> yeah. I, how do I paint that? And I wasn't looking at images of black holes. I was trying to intuit what that felt like. What would it feel like when all the color and light is absorbed uh, in a painting, but the residual material that got absorbed into that center was still visible to my viewer. Thanks, Robin. Okay, and then here's one other one. Um, this is COVID winter and just the beginning of, you know, this notion of just Saskatchewan being enveloped in white, although this is off white. I'm, I've got to go a bit quickly because I've got a few more slides. And here's one other one. But this is also painting light. That's what I was interested in as well. Painting light, either light itself or the absence of light and doing that with acrylic paint. And I am very uh, immersed in this continuing series and I'm showing you eight, I must have 125. Here's another one. This is white light. And this is what it felt like in the winter as well. Um, here. So this was just the beginning. We had some horrendous cold spells here, polar vortexes, and this was the beginning of the polar vortex series that I painted as well. Okay, and then this is the last. Um, uh, I've got four more uh, slides. So back to structural color. I was very captivated by the blue, obviously obsessed with blue, but the blue in the blue morpho butterfly wing. And I wanted to find out how light interacted with the nanostructures of that butterfly wing to produce the blue colors. So I had the structure of the wings blown up like many, many, many times and uh, cut out of hard acrylic. This is one inch thick acrylic. And then I, again, used that technique of transparent gels and laminated them onto the backside of these structures. So you have to imagine light entering each one of those little indentations, like those little tree branches and then those circular indentations and interfering and creating different uh, shades of blue essentially on that butterfly wing. Here are a couple of them, oh, there's three of them maybe. Each one has a different shade of this transparent gel laminated onto the backside. Um, what is fascinating to me about the blue morpho butterfly wing is on the one side, nanostructures create the blue colors in the front side of the wing. On the back side of the wing, it's pigment based color. So in one and the same little critter with this diaphanous wing, you have both nanostructure color, you have structural color on the outside and pigmented color, similar pigment to our skin pigment on the backside. Here is a number of them. There was a window that you can't see. This is just sunlight that's re reflecting onto these acrylic uh, panels through the window. And again, it's just giving you scale. These are some um, watercolor discs and a table, just so that you have a sense of scale and the intensity of these reflections. And this is the last one. So I have uh, 39 of these 
um, that were made that line up to give you um, this incredibly robust um, blue reflected color based on the structure, the nanostructure of the blue morpho butterfly wing. I am in process with this project. I really have been focused on painting over the pandemic year. And I'm hoping that I will pick this up now with the summer and figure out how I am going to display this thing. Um, and just really, I've got the raw materials, but I haven't figured out yet quite how to um, install it and what tweaks I need to do to give it more intensity. And that's what I'll end up doing hopefully this summer. Anyway, what have I got to say back here? Oh, I just wanted to let you know that my website, if you wanna see more um, images is www.marielenew.com. Uh, it's just my name spelled .com. My Instagram again is marielenew5 and my project space is 330smallg.ca. Anyway, thank you very much for indulging me in this um, diatribe of work and I hope that it has illustrated some of the areas of interest of mine uh, in color um, and how I have negotiated strategies uh, to come up with answering some of the questions that I've had about uh, the multidimensional uh, nature of color. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has any. Great, well, thank you so much, Marie. Your work is beyond fabulous. I think it's a really great integration of science, art, moving between them and combining them and um, just really, really lovely. We've had a lot of great comments about your work and well, your website is posted um, and I can post your other ones and we can also put them up on our Facebook page so great. everyone can find your work. Uh, yes. So please everyone can unmute and clap or clap virtually. Thank you for a very, very invigorating, inspiring, beautiful talk. So if anyone has any questions, um, you can put them up in the chat box. Everyone is saying thank you. I'm Should I stop down. sharing my screen or just leave it? Sure, we can. You yeah, can just we can. Leave it. You can. Um, can I ask a question but not type it out? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, um, I just had a question specifically about your Blue Lagoon piece. Um, I also went to Reykjavik, Iceland a few years ago and I went to the Blue Lagoon. Um, interestingly, I went at night. Um, so it was really interesting to see the difference between night and day and how it's lit under the water and how the, the different shades of blue looks different from their, their, their like marketing materials. I was just wondering if for that particular piece when you use that really, really expensive blue pigment, if it was similar to your other piece where you had the different increments which were hourly based from like 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., was that like an amalgamation of um, the blue over the course of the day or was it kind of the representing the time of day that you particularly went to the Blue Lagoon and the blue that you experienced when you went? Well, with phosphorescent powder, there's only one intensity. That's it. Like you don't, you can't put less of the powder in and get a less intense blue. It excites the particles quite sort of uniformly. Um, the blue sky over Saskatoon was, was a time-based piece from 7 to 10 p.m. The phosphorescent work that was in the architecture of color, they were sort of one-shot experiential pieces. So it looks really intensely blue and it in fact was in the exhibition. It wasn't as intense uh, in Iceland. There's no way that it was that intensely blue, but the phosphorescent pigment, it's a powder actually that you buy. It's a raw powder that then you mix. I mixed it into emulsion so that the particles remained suspended uh, and didn't sink to the bottom kind of thing uh, once I applied them. Um, it's just got one intensity. And you can lower the level of light 
Um, I was using fluorescent bulbs because the fluorescent bulbs activated the particles in the, in the phosphorescent uh, pigment um, faster and for a longer period of time. Uh, you could reduce that, but the phosphorescent uh, powder itself just gives you one blue. There's no gradation in the blues. Thank you. And your, your art pieces as well as data visualization is wonderful. Oh, thanks. Come to Saskatoon, you guys. I mean, seriously, <laughs> here's another comment I will make. The way that I see color here on the prairies is very specific to my geographic place. We don't have pollution here. We don't have a shitload of buildings that block my vantage point. I can drive out of Saskatoon for seven minutes and be on bald flat prairie where you can see into the horizon for 35 kilometers uninterrupted. And so I often said to myself when I started out as a painter, why do I want to use transparent medium in my colors? Well, because that's how I see color in the prairies. That's how I see color here in the West. It is this clean, uninterrupted, transparent color that is a direct result of my geographic place. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. I, yeah, oh, that was just a wonderful talk. I'm just going to lower my hand. Uh, in fact, I'll also start the video. Um, that was just fantastic. Just wonderful to see your work. I, I had three questions there. I guess they're in some ways technical questions. One had to do with the phosphorescent piece because it looked a little bit like there was gradations of, uh, of value. Was that just purely optical or? Is that purely much? optical. And it like, I would have, I would have, uh, applied that with a trowel. And so your hand, you know, at the edge of the trowel tape line, there may have been more pressure there or less pressure there than in the center. It was simply um, the handmade coming into play. Yeah. Uh, I had, you know, I didn't orchestrate that. It was totally organic. Yeah. And then the, the other thing I was wondering, and, and um, you may well know the answer to this, and maybe there's physicists among us that would too. The, the piece that piece you showed early on that you described with the with the um, reflection paper, I can't remember the proper name, the, where you described they look like flowers. One was on black, one was on white. Diffraction. And it, diffraction. 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 Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. The, the one on black seemed to be producing much more color. Does that have something to do with the absorption of the yeah, so that's what it is. That's that what it has to do with, absolutely, yeah. And I bought that material from a science laboratory in California. I'm sure you can get it. See, in Saskatoon, I can't get that stuff. Yeah. You can probably buy it, in, you know, in the East, in Ontario, or, in, you know, Toronto, or something like that. But I ended up just sourcing it online and going to a California lab. And they use it um, for spectronomy um, experiments. So under a microscope um, and the various colors in the spectrum, uh, depending on what it is that they're working with, tell them the level of seriousness of let's say a virus or whatever it happens to be that they're working with. Um, and so, um, so it does come from a scientific source, even though light is the way that it's activated. And I used it as an art material. You know? Yeah, I I feel like your work and my work in some ways have been chatting to each other for a long, long time, because I, I was looking at something very similar, and a physicist gave me a slide, you know, like a, like a, and that was as much as I got of the uh, diffraction paper, but, and then the last question I had was, I actually missed how you said you colored the piece that's on the screen right now with the, um, the okay, so, so what I did was, first of all, you get a big sheet of clear acrylic. And this is, this was three eighths of an inch thick. And what you have to do then is laminate these transparent gels. So it's a sheet of transparent blue gel. And you can buy these, again, I found these in Saskatoon. I can't remember the name of the company that I used, but what they use these for are to color glass panels in office buildings, for example. So if they want a gray over an office um, room, let's say a meeting room, they just laminate this over top of the glass. Well, I simply went to that same company and said, I wanna use this on hard acrylic, will it work? And then you have various 
different blues that you can buy. So there's a whole range of blues, like maybe 12 or 15 different blues. And I just picked them out based on, I have a blue morpho butterfly that's been encased in, a, in glass. And so I was referring to an actual butterfly wing in the blue color in the butterfly wing. Now it's not the same and it's not as beautiful, but again, using my materials, I had to figure out how I was going to come up with a similar kind of interactive blue experience as the viewer moved around these pieces. And so I ended up just um, finding a bunch of blues and I also used dichroic gels. So dichroic gels are like the diffraction grading, the transparent diffraction grading. They actually reflect different colors in the spectrum, right? And so some of those are inserted. Like there, there's probably one in this slide, that pinky kind of orangey stuff towards the back, that was probably dichroic, right? Um, and again, it's simply to tweak the viewer experience as you interact and move around um, these particular structures. Sarah, do we, do we communicate on um, Instagram? Like, will you follow me on Instagram and then I can follow you? For sure, yeah, okay, yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Great, and let's uh, like email me. Mm -hmm. I will, for sure. And then one, which, sorry, I, I, I'll just say this. You must know Spencer Finch's work. Of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I've yeah. seen a bunch of his work in the flesh too. And he's definitely someone who's inspired me. Now he uses a lot of, transparent gels that he wraps around fluorescent bulbs, right? Long fluorescent tubes. That's what he gets those star colors, how he gets the star colors. It's small pieces of um, transparent gels that he wraps around those uh, fluorescent tubes. And Robert Irwin does the same thing. Do you know Robert Irwin's work? Yes, of course, but I didn't know that he was working with that kind of uh, material. Yeah. So yeah. the light and space guys, and women in California have been a big uh, influence and interest of mine as well, for sure. I also love how you both take color for a walk. I was just really thinking about your talk, Sarah, when Marie was talking about how color just goes into the space and that's a nice connection. Any other um, questions? comments everybody is just well if anybody does have anything else just email me or instagram like message me on instagram or just connect with me that way you might think of something tomorrow or you know later tonight or whatever that you just mm -hmm. whatever didn't think of now and um i'd be happy to answer anything i can and i'm really curious about your work as well and um please share it with me you know i'd love to see it also, you guys have to come to Saskatoon, as I said, like the experience of great... light here is unlike other places. It just is. That and would you be a actually... great field trip when we can travel again. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you have to actually stand in this to really get it. You know, like I can talk about it and say, oh yeah, it's blue and 35K and all the rest of it. But honestly, it is insane when you can clearly see 35K into the distance. It really is. It's an experience that is just embedded in my psyche now. And, you know, if you ever have an opportunity to come here and experience it as well, I would highly recommend it. Well, well thank you again. Uh, Marie, Marie, we're going to just have you organize a, a project. In okay, your, uh, in and I'll invite space. everybody out. Yeah, we'll, we'll put a big caravan together and go and sleep under the stars, you that's know, it, and spend yeah, days okay. on, on flatlands. I'd yeah. love it. It would be yeah. great. Anyway, <laughs> once again, thank you very, very much for um, inviting me. Um, yeah, what can I say? Well, thank, thank you for you. sharing your yes, beautiful thank work. You very yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah okay. Terrific. Take care. And happy International Color Day, everyone. And if anybody needs, wants to stick around and ask a question uh, now, fine, but it's been a long, been a long time. And so yeah. we look forward to also, you know, just like Marie said, everybody communicate uh, and we'll try to make that easier. And Robin's been working on that on the website. So that blog space might be a, a cool place also. Also, just so you know, Anong, who is going to be speaking in 2022, honestly, she's made me color um, 
the color blobs or whatever you call them. She happens to be a really close friend of the fellow who invited me to go to China. Like they're like father daughter, these two. And he printed for Carl, her, her father, right? Mm. Um, Carl Bean. And yeah. so she's absolutely great. And the work that she's doing with these pigments is just stunning. So yeah, I own a bunch of them. Anyway, okay, I'm, I'm out of here guys. Great. Take care. Thank you so okay. Much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. So, um, Robin, I said this in the chat, and I should just send you an email. But I'd be uh, really happy to work on things for the conference. Um, Obviously, right. I'm in Halifax, but I'm sure there's stuff that can be done at a distance. That's terrific. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Should I send you a formal email so that you, so you formally got that in writing or? Yeah, do that. Okay. I will do that. What, I mean, one thing we've been wondering is um, whether we want to organize a, a visual art show or like at the banquet and welcoming, whether there's any um, kind of performance component or things like that. So that might be a nice area to start thinking yeah, about. For sure, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea, yeah. Yes, and if it, um, uh, if you're looking for funding, then it's now, you know, soon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so maybe a, 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 a conversation, like having a, a separate, a zoom meeting or something that to uh engage with those ideas yeah brainstorm brainstorm mm -hmm. that sounds mm -hmm. good yeah, yeah lovely great thank you good. so much all Thanks. right thank you yeah bye 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 um, bye anybody else have here. have i see some of you still here okay thanks a lot everybody for coming then bye bye, bye, -bye.